Hi everyone, good afternoon and welcome to another Talks at Google event. Uh, today I'm very pleased to be introducing Joshua Foer, who uh, is the co-founder of the website atlasobscura.com and also one of the uh, co-authors of the book by the same name, Atlas Obscura, which is the reason why we're all here today. Um, he is also a best-selling author in the past with books like Moonwalking for Einstein, which is also great and I recommend you read that. Um, but today he's going to be here talking about Atlas Obscura and some of the fascinating and amazing places which are contained within it. Uh, so I think without further ado, I will introduce Joshua Four, and please join me in welcoming him. Thank you so much. Uh, the last time I was here at Google was to talk about Moonwalking with Einstein, my last book. And this time I'm here to talk about this book, Atlas Obscura, which, uh, of which I am one of three co-editors. The book is based on the website Atlas Obscura, which we launched back in 2009. I had recently spent two months driving all over the United States, searching out our nation's strangest, most fascinating corners, outsider art projects, museums that are only open from 2 to 3.30 on Tuesdays, that sort of thing. And my co-founder, Dylan Thuris, was about to set off for a year of travels in Eastern Europe looking for the same kinds of places. And <clears throat> we realized that there was no great resource for travelers like ourselves who were looking for the sorts of wondrous and curious places that expand our sense of what is possible in the world, but which you really need somebody in the know to tell you about. And so we launched Atlas Obscura as a crowdsourced, user-generated website where people could share their knowledge of these sorts of hidden wonders. And the project just kind of grew and grew from there. We started doing events every weekend in New York City. Uh, we now do events every weekend in eight cities around the country. Boston is going to be, hopefully, the ninth. Um, we do international trips all over the world, taking people around to see the world through the lens of Atlas Obscura. Uh, we are on a mission to help people experience a sense of wonder and curiosity about this profoundly strange planet that we all inhabit. And to that end, I thought what I would do today is take you on a kind of whirlwind, quick tour of some of my favorite places that have been uploaded to Atlas Obscura over the years and which now appear uh, in this big, thick book. So let's see here. So this is one of the first places that anybody uh, added to Atlas Obscura where we were like, whoa, is that really for real? Uh, this photo was taken in Cherrapunji, India, one of the wettest places on the planet, where trees are not built so much as grown. What the locals do is they find a young rubber tree uh, that is growing near the edge of a stream or a river, and they build a kind of bamboo scaffolding across the river and uh, over decades, train the roots of that tree to grow across the river. It can take upwards of 20 years before a root bridge is strong enough to support human weight, but then it keeps growing and getting stronger from there, and these bridges can last for upwards of 500 years. The one you're seeing here is a double-decker. Those are two bridges. One is 60 feet, one is 80 feet, and they are grown from the roots of the same tree. You have probably heard the story of Moses parting the Red Sea. Well, according to Korean legend, he is not the only person to have ever performed this miraculous feat. The story goes that on the little Korean island of Jindo, uh, there was a pack of wild tigers uh, attacking the population. Everybody managed to flee the island, save for one elderly lady, who prayed to the sea god that there might be some way off the island and lo, her prayers were heard, and a causeway appeared, connecting Jindo to the nearby island of Modo, and she was able to escape. Twice a year, ever since, that causeway has opened up regularly. Uh, and the locals celebrate by uh, marching from each side, from each island. They put on kind of muck boots, walk to the center of the Yellow Sea, meet in the middle. The festivities are actually rather short-lived because the tides start to recede, and the causeway only connects them for about one hour at a time. So in 1958, there was an eccentric city planner 
named Nat Mendelssohn, who had this utopian vision of creating a car-centric mega metropolis in the middle of the Mojave Desert that was going to be bigger than Los Angeles. And he got so far as laying out this vast grid of streets. He named every street in California City. And for reasons that, in retrospect, maybe seem kind of obvious, that's as far as the project ever got. Because like, really, who wants to live in the middle of the Mojave Desert? But you can still explore the sand sloughed streets of California City to this day. They are this kind of utopian, this uh, abandoned utopian mid-century ghost town waiting to be explored. Every year, uh, we hold an annual celebration of wonder and curiosity called Obscura Day, where uh, fans of Atlas Obscura travel out and have sort of, uh, we, we, we send expeditions to places like California City. And on one of the first Obscura Days, we had 400 people uh, from Los Angeles venture out into the middle of the Mojave Desert to do a photo documentation project of California City. Now, this 200-foot flaming hole in the ground may look like the mouth of an active volcano, but it's actually the result of a man-made industrial accident. So in 1971, a group of Soviet geologists who were out prospecting for natural gas in the Turkmen Desert, Turkmenistan Desert, accidentally punctured a cavern filled with methane. The roof collapsed, uh, the drilling rig fell in, and all of this toxic methane started to escape. The geologists thought the solution to the problem was going to be to light this hole on fire. They thought it might burn off in a couple of days, a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months. It's been burning for 45 years. The locals call it the gates of hell. And in 2010, the Turkmen president said, you know, maybe we want to cap this thing so we can safely explore and exploit the natural gas in the region. Fortunately, that hasn't happened yet. But with new pipelines coming in, it does seem possible that the gates of hell may not be open for that much longer. So until the 19th century, um, it was still something of a mystery. What happened to white storks in the winter? They suddenly would seem to disappear. Uh, in ancient times, Aristotle had hypothesized that storks, along with the other disappearing avian species, went into hibernation, perhaps at the bottom of the ocean. But in 1822, a stunning piece of evidence came to light that helped to solve this mystery of where birds disappear to in the winter. In 1822, on a estate near Mecklenburg, Germany, this white stork was shot. And it was found with a two and a half foot long Central African spear embedded in its neck. It had apparently flown the entire distance from its equatorial wintering grounds in this impaled state. You can find this specimen in uh, the University of Rostock Zoological Collection, along with 60,000 other specimens. <coughs> This is a Buddhist monk named Shinayokai, who mummified himself to death in 1783. Now, this was not an uncommon practice from about the 11th century until the earliest part of the 20th century. And you may be asking yourself, like, OK, I have a vague idea about how you would go about mummifying somebody else. But like, how do you mummify yourself? Well, it can be an up to 10-year process. It starts by uh, eating a diet of nothing but roots, uh, seeds, and nuts for about 1,000 days, followed by a diet of tree bark and the sap of a tree that is more commonly used to lacquer wood. You effectively lacquer your body. And when a monk who was practicing this ultimate act of self-denial felt himself nearing death, he would enter a stone tomb sit himself in the lotus position and recite mantras, waiting for his end to come. There would be a little bell in the tomb that he would ring every day to let everybody know that he was still alive. And when the bell stopped ringing, his followers would take the monk out of the tomb and put him on display to be venerated. Something like uh, 200 monks attempted this kind of self-mummification over the centuries. About two dozen were successful. 16 of them are still on display to this day in northern Japan. 
This one is a little bit closer to home. Uh, this is in northern Minnesota. And what you see here are two waterfalls that stem from the same stream. The one on the right tumbles over a 50-foot cliff and ultimately makes its way to Lake Superior. The waterfall on the left, however, disappears into that hole, and nobody knows where it goes. It's known as the Devil's Kettle. And this has been puzzling Minnesotans for ages. People have dropped uh, dye into this hole. They have dropped ping pong balls into this hole. They even dropped GPS devices into this hole, hoping to figure out where the Devil's Kettle, this portal to nowhere, ultimately takes this water. And nobody has yet figured it out. What we do know is that somewhere, somewhere in Minnesota, there is a vast cache of ping pong balls <laughs> waiting to be discovered. Ah. <clears throat> so there is something very strange in the air where the Catatumbo River empties into Lake Maracaibo in western Venezuela. And a few years back, I went to go check out this phenomenon. So for something like upwards of 260 nights a year, for upwards of 10 hours a night, lightning pierces the sky over one precise spot at the western edge of Lake Maracaibo. Uh, it's this everlasting lightning storm, as it's been called, has been raging for as long as anybody can remember. In the late 16th century, when Sir Francis Drake tried to take the city of Maracaibo. His position was revealed by these flashing lightning bolts. Same thing happened in 1823 to the Spanish Navy during the Venezuelan uh, War for Independence. Nobody knows exactly why it is that this lightning storm rages so constantly in such a precise spot. It seems to have something to do with uh, just the really unique topological conditions of the area. You've got cold air streaming in off the Andes. You've got warm air flowing in from the Caribbean. They seem to meet over an area, a, a swampy bog area, that is emitting methane, which might be implicated in this phenomenon. And what we do know is that with 1.2 million lightning strikes per year, this is believed to be the world's largest natural producer of ozone. So from the time that airplanes were first uh, converted into military weapons in World War I until World War II when radar was first actively deployed against airplanes, nobody knew how you were supposed to detect an incoming bombing raid. This was the English solution. They built gigantic concrete ears and pointed them at Germany. And the idea was there would be a uh, at the center of the parabola, a little listening post where a man would basically have stethoscopes in his ears listening for the faint rumble of distant engines. Now, obviously, these quickly became obsolete with the invention of radar, but you can still find these giant concrete listening posts along the southeastern coast of England waiting to be explored. The Incans, uh, who had the largest empire in the world at the turn of the 15th century, Never invented the wheel, never invented the arch. Um, they never really discovered a form of written writing. They never discovered iron. But they were masters of fiber. So they built ships out of fiber. You can still find them sailing on Lake Titicaca today. They built armor out of fiber that was stronger pound for pound than anything the conquistadors had. And they even communicated in fiber using a system known as Kipo. And so when it came to figuring out how you were supposed to span the vast ravines of the Andes, they naturally thought of fiber. And when the Spanish arrived in Peru at the in, uh, beginning of the 16th century, the end of the 15th century, they found bridges all over the Andes, over 200 of them, woven entirely out of grass. Spaniards were, of course, terrified of these bridges. These were bridges spanning longer distances than anything in Europe that had been built out of stone. Europeans didn't, invent, didn't build uh, suspension bridges until the 19th century. And to this day, at, there is only one grass suspension bridge left 
uh, in Peru. It's called the Quechua Chaca, and that's, you can see me there crossing right there in the middle. And this bridge has been in existence for at least 500 years. And what's remarkable about it is that its permanence is a function of its impermanence. So every year, this bridge has to be renewed. And four nearby villages all congregate for a three-day festival where they weave a new bridge out of grass, burn down the old bridge, and string up a new one. And it is that cultural tradition that has maintained this bridge for 500 years. Just a few hundred yards upstream, there is a metal truss bridge that was built by the Peruvian government, which is what most people now use to cross this stream. But it's languishing. It's rusty. It's in disrepair. If I had to place a bet, I would bet this one is going to outlast it. Uh, what you're looking at here is the world's largest musical instrument. This is known as the stalactite organ, and it is located deep underground in Luray Caverns in Virginia. In the 1950s, a mathematician and um, electronics engineer named, gloriously named, Leland Sprinkle, <laughs> figured out that if you tap on a stalactite in a cave with a rubber mallet, it generates a tone. And if you can identify just the right stalactites, just the right size, you can actually create a full tonal spectrum. And so he scoured Luray Caverns looking for uh, pitch-perfect stalactites, attached rubber mallets to them, wired them up with five miles of wire, connected them to this four-keyboard church organ, and started playing the world's largest musical instrument. He actually recorded an album called um, Musical Gems from Solid Rock. And it's available, I think, to this day in the Luray Caverns gift, uh, gift store. You know, it used to be impossible to predict the weather. Like, even one day out, it was impossible to predict the weather. And in 1851, a English surgeon named George Merriweather unveiled at the Great Exhibition in London a contraption that he said was going to revolutionize meteorology. He called it the Tempest Prognosticator. Meriwether had noticed that in the lead up to a big storm, freshwater leeches started to get kind of agitated. And he thought, I can build a weather prediction machine off of this. And so he constructed this kind of Victorian carousel with glass bottles. Each one contained a leech. Each leech was connected to a wire, each wire to a bell, so that when the pressure started to change and a storm was coming in, the leeches would start to shimmy and the bells would ring, alerting us to the incoming storm. Sadly. Tragically, this device never really caught on. <laughs> but you can still find a working, so to speak, replica of the Tempest Prognosticator in one of these little museums that Atlas Obscura lives to celebrate. It's called Barometer World Exhibition. It's in Devon, England. Uh, so this, some of you may recognize, is the entrance to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem the most holy pilgrimage site of the Christian faith. This is where Jesus uh, supposedly died, uh, was crucified, died, resurrected inside this church. And if you look up uh, above the door, you will see a centuries-old wooden ladder. Now, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is governed by, a, uh, by no fewer than six different Christian denominations, each of which has uh, a certain area of the church as its domain. And there are an arcane set of rules to ensure that fights don't break out between the sects. So in fact, uh, I believe it was in 2002, 11 uh, Coptic and Ethiopian monks ended up in the hospital over one of them moving a chair eight inches on a stifling hot, stiflingly hot day in order to get some shade. Uh, this particular ladder seems to have been placed in its present position sometime in the mid-1700s, perhaps by a worker fixing a window. We don't know. And over the years since then, nobody has had the gumption to try and move it, except for a mischievous tourist in 1997 who absconded with the ladder and hid it behind an altar where it went unfound for several weeks. Eventually, it was found and replaced in its appropriate spot. Oh, I'm not even going to tell you what these are. 
these are these are called necro pants. These um, these were a fashionable item in Iceland in the 17th century. I encourage you to look them up in the book. <laughs> now, this incredible water pole is called Gakta, and it's located just outside of a small village in a remote area in northern Peru called Cocachimba. And until 2005, nobody outside of this tiny village of Cocachimba was aware of these waterfalls' existence. They were on no government maps. They were in no government documents. There was no road, no electricity going into Cocachimba. In that year, a German tourist stumbled into the village, looked up at these incredible waterfalls, and said to the locals, do you have any idea how tall these things are? They said, no, we, we have no idea. We've never measured them. He comes back the following year with surveying equipment, and he measures Gokta Falls, and finds that, by some measure, these are the third tallest waterfalls in the entire world. I went with Dylan, co-founder of Atlas Obscura, to go check out Gokta Falls a few years after the German tourist. And we had a chance to talk to the locals. And they said something really remarkable. They said, you know, we had a sense that these waterfalls were majestic. We just didn't realize they might be that majestic in comparison to everything else that might exist in the world. And at a certain point, we kind of stopped noticing them. Even the heaviest diamond ring ultimately begins to feel weightless on the hand that's wearing it. And in a way, that is what Atlas Obscura is all about. There is wonder all around us, all around us if we're willing to pay attention and look for it. And you don't have to go to some distant remote corner of Peru to find it. It's right around the corner. It's in our own backyard, in a thousand places in a city like Boston. And our job as humans is to seek out that wonder and to revel in it. And we want Atlas Obscura to be your guide. Thank you. And I think we have time for a, a couple questions, if anybody has them. I have a really, sure. really important question. Yes. It's bothering me. And uh, I, I think you may be able to address this. The word obscura looks like a Latin word. So oh, we man. expect Latin grammar to apply. Atlas is a masculine singular noun. <laughs> and so you'd expect it to be uh, Atlas Obscurus. Or maybe it's the Atlas of Obscure Things, in which case it would be Atlas Obscurorum. So what the hell is Atlas Obscura? You know, we've been at this for seven years. We recognized that that was a problem when we came up with the name. And lo and behold, it took seven years <laughs> before somebody would stand up and call us on it. So my applause to you. Yes. <laughs> Is there any relationship between you guys and the uh, Center for Land Use Interpretation who seem to be in a similar way? You know, there are like a handful of organizations, a lot of them, uh, all over the country, all over the world, who we feel a kind of connection to, a simpatico connection to, and they're one of them. We've done events with them uh, out in Los Angeles, and I, I'm sure we would love to do more, I'm sure. I just have to ask, what was it like crossing that woven bridge in the Andes? Uh, first of all, did, did I, were you at Google in New York? No. Did I meet you once? No, OK. Um, uh, what was it like? It was terrifying. <laughs> it, it was frankly terrifying. First of all, you can see the old bridge just sort of in the river beneath you. <laughs> and uh, we met the guy who weaves, he's called the bridge keeper. And his job that he acquired from his father, who acquired it from his father, and which he will pass on to his son, is to be in charge of the bridge, to be its chief engineer. And I sat with him and watched him take the grass, roll it up, braid it, roll three braids into a, long, into a tighter braid. And after watching him do that, I was um, no more comfortable crossing the bridge. <laughs> yeah. 
So you, this, this Atlas Obscura seems to be an atlas of the present, but I'm looking here at Church of St. Simeon the Stylite in Syria, which is just outside of Aleppo, which probably doesn't stand anymore, and you were talking about the gates of hell being closed. How do you feel about your atlas becoming an atlas of the past rather than the present? You know, when we started this project, one of our concerns, we had, a, we had a handful of concerns. One of them was, you know, what we're doing is shedding light on places that are obscure. And what happens when you do that? Like, do these places get ruined? Just like, you know, the band that you liked that suddenly becomes popular starts to suck. Um, are we actually destroying these places in the process of shedding light on them? And what we have seen over these last seven years is that quite a few places that we started in Atlas Obscura ended up with a little closed or out of business or disappeared kind of, uh, we actually had to insert a tag on the site so you could identify places as no longer extant. These places disappear not because they are overloved, but because they're underloved. And we've seen too many of these little great museums go out of business because they just don't have people coming to see them. So we're kind of comfortable with our role in helping to make sure that these places uh, continue to have a life into the future. Well, thank you guys very much for having me. This has been a real pleasure.